Yo, 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 welcome to this special post-Thanksgiving edition of Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. It's the show that wonders who you sat next to this past Thursday, like this HBO meme. Personally, I would like to sit next to my cool cousin, but I'm disappointed my favorite cool uncle who's always on the phone handling business didn't make the list. Anyway, let's move on to some hot takes. <laughs> Let's start with the news. Odell Beckham Jr., who never met an NBA player he didn't want to take a selfie with, might be giving us hints where he's taking his talents next with these new Zoom generation cleats inspired by the South Beach LeBron 8 and the LeBron 9 Elite. I just want to know if he's going to give these to a real quarterback next game like he did Tom Brady that one time. Papa John's founder and N-Word user John Schnatter gave an interview where he claimed that the company he founded was in decline and that he ate 40 pizzas in 30 days to come to that realization. I've had over 40 pizzas in the last 30 days. That's gross. Yeah, I came to the realization that John shouldn't be giving interviews when he said the N-word ate 40 pizzas in 30 days and now looks like the Joker took off his makeup. Just a thought. Fans of 90s alternative pop rock will be happy to know that for $100, you too can have Sugar Ray frontman Mark McGrath break things off with your future ex via Cameo. If you're wondering, I have considered doing Cameo, but I don't know how to price myself. I mean, I know I'm not worth $450 like iced tea, but I'm worth more than the $25 some random and contestants on Temptation Island is charging, right? No, it's Real? Like $15. F 15 Okay. Speaking of popular music from back in the day, <sighs> Amarion has announced a Millennium 2020 tour with Bow Wow as the co-headliner, along with acts like Soldier Boy and the Ying Yang Twins. Pretty sure all of these guys are on Cameo too. Man, you know, I still have baggy jean shorts and Tims in storage somewhere for when these guys were actual headliners. Just goes to show you that nostalgia and Cameo is coming for all of us. Nobody say <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. And now for a new segment we like to call Nike by Ye. I see what you did there. This week, the Nike Kyrie 6 debut on Nike by you or what most of us still like to call it Nike ID like I get what they were going for but keep the Nike ID name guys it's like calling me a real talk show host let's be honest I'm on YouTube now that it's possible to design a unique one-of-a-kind colorway of the Kyrie 6 sneakerheads can now do what they've always wanted create a close approximation of a Nike Air Yeezy 2 without having to pay thousands of dollars for the real thing as much as Nike may want to downplay what Kanye West did for the brand they can't deny that people to this day still want a Nike branded shoe that comes in one of three different styles, the pure platinum, the solar red, and the red October. And now, thanks to PJ Tucker, most new sneakerheads are aware of another colorway of the Yeezy 2, the Kobe-inspired Cheetah sample. See, there was this Nike Kobe 7 Christmas Day colorway that was called the Cheetah, and it was purple, even though there's no such thing as a purple Cheetah. Then there was a leaked sample of a purple Yeezy 2 that's inspired by the Cheetah Kobe, and instead of questioning it and wondering why we're just okay with a purple Cheetah, Cheetah, we kind of just went with it and moved on. Man, 2012 was such a different time. Wait, there's no such thing as a purple no, cheetah? No, there's no such thing as a purple cheetah. No. Come on, come on, Juan. Creating Yeezy 2 and occasionally Yeezy 1 inspired colorways on Nike by You is a tradition for as long as Kanye has been around. Without fail, Every new sneaker that hits the service with a glow-in-the-dark outsole and a bright crimson or solar red collar lining option is going to get the Yeezy treatment. From the latest like Giannis's Zoom Freak 1 to older Kyrie's to legacy kicks like the Air Flight 89 and Air Max 90, we've seen all the Yeezy tributes. But the Kyrie 6 is different from the pack because its design is so reminiscent of the Nike Air Yeezy 2 that I can't believe Kanye hasn't said or tweeted anything about it yet. It's early. Then again, then, then again, he is busy with operas that Brad Pitt attends and trying to make Yeezys that look like the Las Plagas from Resident Evil 4. Man, those are gross. Maybe Kanye has moved on from Nike and isn't interested in trolling them by jumping over the Jumpman anymore, but for some reason, it appears that there might be lingering feelings over at Nike. That's because when people tried to create the Yeezy 2 inspired Kyrie 6s, they hit a snag at the finish line because they couldn't add the glow in the dark outsole to complete the look. You can only use the glow in the dark option in certain circumstances, such as the forefoot being in either white, sail, or wolf gray. So yes to recreating pure platinums and red Octobers, no to solar reds and cheetahs. But why? Was this like a new policy at Nike because I can make Zoom Freak 1s in solar red, the KD-12 actually looks really fire when a cheetah homage, and both the PG-3 and the latest LeBron Soldier both have a glow-in-the-dark option ready to go in seemingly every 
color. Is there a technical reason why the Kyrie 6 cannot glow unless it's used with these three specific forefoot options? Could it be that Nike realizes the Kyrie 6s are dead ringers for the Yeezy 2 and they just shut off the glow option to avoid comparisons? But if this is intentional and not just some strange coincidence, this makes Nike kind of look like the ex who is still not over their breakup. Sure. Nike is cool and all nonchalant about it, so they wear their disguise till they go home at night and turn down all the lights and then they break down and cry. Wait, did you just quote uh, break down by Mariah Carey? Uh, anyways, it's just, it just seems petty if Nike did this intentionally, right? Like, is Mark Parker really sitting around waiting for his last day at work and making decisions like this because he has nothing better to do? Does Nike feel threatened by the Yeezy comparisons? If there was some sort of collusion to make sure there's no solar red Kyrie sixes from Nike by you, doesn't this just make Yeezys even more popular? It's just a little weird, that's all. Can't believe that after all these years, it would be Nike listening to 808s and heartbreaks with Kanye living in their minds rent free. I it's, still can't believe you used the breakdown by Mariah Carey. It's, a good, it's a good song. Moving on to the heat check. <laughs> Uh, this is where we take a look at the upcoming releases that have caught our attention and our wallets. Our wallets do a lot of crying around this time of the year. First up on December 2nd, the Air Jordan 4 Winter. This is gonna cost you 200 bucks. Speaking of shoes that look like other shoes, the Air Jordan 4 Winter can look like a misguided attempt at copying the famous Eminem 4s, but it's actually designed for the cold months in 8 Mile with several changes to the upper that give it a more rugged yet premium vibe. I'm definitely gonna be grabbing myself a pair of these. December 4th, we get the Louis Vuitton LV408 Tokyo. The Virgil Abloh design luxury sneaker drops with exclusive colorways of the hang tag, depending on what region of the world you live in. That's pretty ballsy to not bother making additional colorways instead. Now, if you're wondering if I'm eyeing those purple tags from the Tokyo release, the answer, like most things related to Japan, is yes. Then December 5th, we have the Adidas Ultra Boost 2020 International Space Station pack. I have to say, if I ever got the chance to go to the moon or just hang out at the International Space Station, but I could only bring one sneaker, it would probably be the Ultra Boost. This pack not only gives us our first look at the 2020 Ultra Boost, but also new boost cushioning colors, including some iridescent pairs, might be worth it. December 6th, we have the Nike LeBron 17 win-win. Returning champ Harlem Fashion Row collaborates on another LeBron silhouette after making such a huge impression based on their previous work. I love the return of the Rays Lion logo that makes a high-end basketball shoe feel like a luxury drop. These are dope. And then for the pick of the week, we have the Nike Dornbecker Freestyle Collection, which drops on December 7th. The 2019 iteration from the Dornbecker Kids features the Zoom Pegasus Turbo, the Air Jordan 14, React Element 55, and more. As always, proceeds from the sales of these Dornbecker shoes go to the children's hospital. So don't resell them, you coward. Don't resell them. <laughs> And now for this week's Hard Pass, where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go, like Adidas and Prada teasing us with some fancy collaboration. And it turns out the first thing out the gate is a white superstar with Prada branding on it. We can try harder, right guys? What's next, a Stan Smith with Prada on the side? Probably. Uh, this week's Hard Pass goes to the, the way we've always done it as an excuse to not embrace change crowd. Like imagine if we never upgraded to iPhones and Galaxies and Pixels and stuck with our Blackberries and Sidekicks because we thought touch screens were weird. Wait, 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 don't hate on the sidekick. I, I love the sidekick too. Or if we never got past the Nintendo 64 analog stick and eventually refined it into what we find in modern consoles today, try playing Mario 64 with a D-pad and tell me how that goes. Unless you are a baby Yoda, yes, we can spoil the Mandalorian now because everybody else has oh and have a perpetual floating crib that lets you use force powers in the most adorable way possible for 50 years, you will eventually have to move and get the ball rolling. In the case of the NBA, they seem to be trying something new and revolutionary in American sports to get the ball rolling, but it's being met with a lot of resistance. There are reports that the league is going to introduce several different proposals in order to bring more interest in the game. It's an effort to fight back against declining TV ratings as seemingly every NBA fan under the age of 30 now watches and analyzes games exclusively through House of Highlight clips in Ringer podcasts. That's not even a knock on the kids. It's a reality that in our busy lives, we don't always have the time or money to go to an arena and watch a game, but we still want to be involved. So we watch condensed versions of games on YouTube, then head off to do the next thing. There's a big difference between 10 minutes and two and a half to three hours. I can't tell you the number of times I've been to an NBA regular season game or watched one on TV and thought about bringing a laptop so I can work on other things while paying half attention to the game. Oh, look at you fancy going <laughs> to a game. The, reg laptop. the regular season is a slog that seemingly lasts forever, and that's why the league is trying to pitch 
several groundbreaking ideas that could make us pay more attention. The ones that have been reported on various news outlets include the elimination of conferences and just pick the best 16 teams for the playoffs, the reduction of regular season games from 82 to 75 or less, and the introduction of tournaments such as a mid-season cup like in European Soccer League and a single elimination one that determines the bottom seeds for the playoffs. If any of these things get approved, the logistics of making this all happen anytime soon is going to be difficult, not to mention the potential for lost revenue for owners and reduced salaries for players probably isn't going to go over well either. But as a fan, I'm all for it. The last time the regular season was compelling from start to finish was during the lockout year in 2012. The season actually started on Christmas Day and every game had a little more added pressure because each win and loss was magnified. The finals that season, an OKC team with Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, and James Harden against a Miami Heat Big Three with LeBron, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh. Those were all still young legs that could go and we got an entertaining five game series in the process. Today, we have Kawhi Leonard testing the limits of how far he can stretch the patience of the league with his load management schedule. As the game gets faster and more dynamic, injuries are wrecking some of our most promising young stars before they even get a chance to hit the court. Get well soon, Sion. Meanwhile, adding tournaments feels kind of tacked on, especially a mid-season one that isn't the NBA championship. But if I can draw an analogy to the absurd world of pro wrestling, if the league can market this tournament like the Intercontinental Championship and it guarantees the winner something down the line, whether it's a lottery pick or a first round buy or the chance to challenge the NBA champion to a one game showdown to determine the real who the real champ is, the possibilities could be fun. Like imagine if Dallas won the midseason tournament and Luka Doncic held a championship belt like he was Rasheed Wallace waiting to take on whoever wins the finals. But what if Dallas wins both the midseason tournament and the finals, then he's Luka two belts like Becky Lynch. Look, golfers like Tiger Woods and Brooks Kepka don't put as much stock in end of season tournaments as they do in the four majors that happen every year. And there's a reason for that. In the Philippines, where basketball is as popular as football is here in America, they essentially have three seasons throughout the year and each of them has a modifier that makes them stand out. There's so much promise with these proposed changes that one of the things stopping them that doesn't involve money are the traditionalists, AKA the olds. Mm. They say that if you reduce the number of games, then you can't connect the game to the past anymore as if Steph Curry and Bob Cousy are playing the same game of basketball. There's the argument that records will be harder to reach. And I say, doesn't that make it more interesting if LeBron has less games to work with in order to catch Kareem? And besides, is there an NBA statistic that even matters in the culture like Hank Aaron's old home run record for baseball or 2,000 yards rushing in football? Eh, not really. Times change, people evolve. And so should a league that is nearing its 75th season, which is sad because I'm old enough to be outraged when Dominique Wilkins doesn't make the top 50 list. Anyways, if these athletes are wrecking themselves playing 82 games a year and you add on all the miles they already racked up playing in college and in high school and in AAU, not to mention all those Instagram workouts, it's a whole lot more than MJ ever did. And he retired for a year and a half to play minor league baseball, which isn't anywhere near as grueling physically as pro basketball. What are you saying about baseball? With fewer games, the stakes are higher. The rivalries mean a little bit more and the chase for a chip, either one, becomes greater. We had to evolve from the BlackBerry and now we have to evolve from the 82 game grind. The question remains though, do the players and the owners want this enough to sacrifice some money now in the hopes that less games will mean more attention is being paid to even a random Utah Charlotte's game on a Wednesday night? Well, let's hope so. That's gonna do it for the show. Thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I am Jacques Slade. I am thankful for all of you who watch the show and have helped in making it grow. I definitely appreciate you. I'll see you next week, but not before I show you one thing I couldn't relate to then and one thing I can relate to now. Post Malone jamming to Shania Twain. I think I'm gonna order those Bow Wow tickets now. I'll see you guys next week.